fine. <laughs> you can just do a quick intro. Okay, cool. that's all yours. Right. You okay? Here we go. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Ariel Hernandez. I am a, a senior MSDP candidate in Zhao Jing Wang's lab. Uh, I'm honored to introduce today's guest speaker on behalf of the T32 trainees in the cancer biology program, as well as the lung, head, and neck cancer programs. Uh, our guest speaker today received his bachelor's degree, as well as his MD and PhDs, at the University of Paris before starting what he expected to be a temporary postdoctoral position at the NIH. Uh, 30 years later, he is now the chief of the developmental therapeutics branch and laboratory of molecular pharmacology at the NIH, as well as co-chair of the discovery committee of the NCI experimental therapeutics program. He has received countless awards, uh, including several federal technology transfer awards uh, for his discoveries of DNA uh, topoisomerase, HIV integrase, and cell cycle checkpoint inhibitors, uh, as well as a NIH merit award for his role in elucidating the function of uh, topoisomerases as targets for anti-cancer drugs. His dedication to, to science speaks for itself with over 600 publications and over 30 patents with various inhibitors. Uh, that's an ins inspiring 20 papers per year and one patent per year. These uh, contributions are exponentially appreciated through his hands-on approach uh, to, of mentoring over 50 trainees from all over the world. Uh, he describes his career as being a musician on tour, trying to give his all to put on a good show day after day. So with that, please join me in giving a warm welcome to today's performer, Dr. Pamir. Okay, thank you. So before we start, what I wanted to do is, uh, uh, so I've spent most of my time, and I still spend most of my time working on topoisomerases, so for those who want to know what they are uh, and have interest, uh, I want to put a plug. There is a, a Gordon Research Conference and a Gordon Research Seminar for the younger crowd, and they can stay for the whole conference, and that's being held at the end of July uh, near Boston. And uh, this will deal with a lot of, of, uh, of aspects of topoisomerases, chromatin biology, antibacterial and anti-cancer drug discovery, chromatin structure and DNA topology, transcription recombination repair, cancer and uh, neurological disease. So you could go to the website on your own and uh, it's easy to go to the GRC website and you just do GRC uh, topoisomerase and just explore the program. And if you want to attend, I would be very happy to see you there and uh, that would be a crash course on topoisomerase. So what I want to do now is, uh, from the talk today, is uh, discuss something you probably don't hear very much, which is new topo-1 inhibitor, something you've heard a lot, which is PARP inhibitor, and precision medicine, which is a goal, not yet a, a true reality. Uh, with DNA targeted agents. So as, as I go forward, uh, I want to give you a little bit of introduction to the uh, topoisomerases. So the DNA, as you know, is like your computer cable, except it's about two meter long in one cell. It, it's susceptible to many, many intertwining and problems like you have in your backpack, and the, the genome has to deal with it. And the way it deals with it is by using topoisomerases. So when the DNA makes supercoils, uh, because it's being transcribed or it's being replicated, you form what we call negative or positive supercoils ahead of the DNA. So if I took my cord, you know, I just put it randomly into, but you could see how bad it is, and I didn't attempt to do this, so the cells have to deal with this. So, and the way they deal with it is with topoisomerases. So the supercoils are removed by uh, topo-1, topo-1 mitochondrial, topo-2-alpha, topo-2-beta, and also by topo-3-alpha and topo-3-beta. So it means that all six topoisomerases in your cells, as we speak, 
or at work, making sure there is no supercoil and the DNA is relaxed. The second problem that has to be dealt with is at the end of replication, DNA forms catenanes, and these needs to be untangled. That's the role specifically of topo 2. So they decatenate, but they also can catenate as well. The other problem is the knots. So these are very readily formed in cells, and to undo the knots, the cells will do is there's an intramolecular knot, they will just break one strand, one duplex, go through and re-ligate. So that's what the topo 2 do, topo 2 alpha and topo 2 beta. And then come the topo 3 enzyme. So the topo 3s uh, are working to unravel replication intermediates such as double hooded junctions. So when you have crossovers of single-stranded regions, the topo will just cleave one strand, pass it through, and re-ligate. So these are magical enzymes. So these are the magician of the genome. And more recently, what's come up it is that topo 3 beta, topo 3b, uh, is an RNA topo isomerase. So this is exactly what this will be, okay? So you got this, topo 3b, which is going to cut and make it all clean and nice. Uh, but that's for RNA. And what it's deal with human health is that it's been found that in schizophrenic population in Finland, uh, topo 3 beta is inactivated in those patients. So in neuron, it appears that uh, uh, RNA no knots are quite prominent and need to be resolved, probably in the immune system as well. So there's a lot of interest on the topo isomerases beyond cancer, beyond antibacterial um, altogether. So what the outline of what I want to talk about, the, the three or four parts. The first part is uh, talk to you about the new TOPO1 inhibitor that are being developed at the NCI. So these are things that we discovered. Uh, the second one is how do we match the drug with tumor-specific defect? And I will discuss uh, the, uh, uh, what is open to us, which is the cell line genomics and how useful it could be and then uh, go into a new determinant of response to DNA damage, which you may have heard or may not have heard of, which I think you will hear about more and more with time, which is called Schlafen 11. And then uh, I will end up with something I feel very strongly about, is that uh, doing targeted delivery. So the optimization of drugs. So. Um, the, some drugs are in the clinic, and it's not because they're in the clinic that we're done. Uh, in the TOPO1 inhibitors, there are two TOPO1 inhibitors in the clinic. Uh, they are called topo TCAN and irino -TCAN. And they were approved in the late 2000s, 2000s, and they were the last chemo to be approved before the wave of precision medicine uh, targeted therapy kinase inhibitors. And there were only one chemical class. So as this was happening, we embarked on the effort to discover novel TOPO1 inhibitors, and I'll tell you why. So this effort, which was started now, I would say about 20 years ago, 15 years ago, when, when we launched this at the NCI, led to the identification of drugs which are called the adenoisoquinolines. And the reason we discovered those drugs is that we knew that the camptotecin, so topotecan and irinotecan, which are derivative of the natural product camptotecin, all have a chemical problem, is that the natural product is alpha-hydroxylactone, and very quickly in the blood, it gets inactivated to the carboxylate, which is inactive. And in spite of this, the camptotecin were approved and are approved and are used in the clinic, and we know that they are not optimum. So what we wanted to do, the first thing, was to make drugs that didn't have this alpha-hydroxylactone, and we did that. And after about 500 drugs, as you mentioned, patents and you know, intellectual property coverage, then we ended up with three compounds that we decided at the NCI to push forward for clinical development, which is totally counter to what most biotechs would do, because they were all in kinase inhibitors. We, we still went on. So the three compounds, now called LMP400, Andotecan, LMP776, and Dimitecan, and LMP744. They've been put at the NCI Clinical Center in clinical trial, and two of them finished phase one, Andotecan and Imidotecan, uh, and this has been published last year. 
So while we were doing this, another effort of the NCI was to test these new drugs into, into animals that had primary tumors. And for this, we took advantage of one NCI program, which is the Comparative Oncology Trial Consortium, uh, which is Comparative Oncology Program, which uh, is a setup of multiple veterinary clinics all across the United States. And you could see there is one in Colorado, uh, which contributed to this effort. So with all this team coordinated through the NCI, the three TOPO-1 inhibitors were administered to dogs which had lymphoma, which is not rare in dogs. So the, this is the, the program. You could go on the website of the NCI. It will tell you uh, how it works and what it is. So we, we, we had this, and the drugs were formulated and administered to drugs, and our goals were simple. Things we could not do so easily in humans, we could do in dogs because that was much easier to do. So we could compare the three drugs, LMP 400, 776, 744. We could determine the maximum tolerated dose in dogs with primary lymphoma. So these are not artificial tumors, they are real tumors. We could compare the activity of the three drugs, see whether they were active and whether one was better. Determine the pharmacokinetics, which is much easier to do in dogs, especially if you want to do pharmacokinetic in tumor. In humans, it's very hard. Lymphoma was feasible. And we could determine target engagement using gamma H2AX and topo-1 down regulation. So this study is not published. It's been submitted. I'll see, show you one uh, of the outcome of the study. So each bar is a, a, a particular dog, and treatment, and each panel is one particular drug. And these are the two people who really pushed this forward with Jim Dorosho to set up the program and Amy as the lead veterinary coordinator. So these are the responses. And you could see that a number of drugs respond to the drug, and the darker the color, the higher the dose. And you could, for yourself, you already see that one clearly was better than the other. They all worked but one was clearly better, and it was even good at fairly low dose. So what happened with this, then we concluded at the end of the dog clinical trial that this drug, which we had not initially chosen for the human trial, now went back and is now back in phase one. So what's happening is Jim Dorosho has taken back 744, and it's now in phase one at the clinical center at the NIH. So what we have done is that uh, the two clinical endenoisoquinoline that had selected, been selected for man do exhibit anti-tumor activity. That's a good sign. That the third endenoisoquinoline, which we had not put in human, deserves to be looked at and because it has even greater anti-tumor activity, and it's now in phase one. We could determine the dose-limiting toxicity for all these drugs based on the DOG trial, which is much better than murine models. And uh, in all cases the bone marrow was the dose-limiting toxicity, which you would expect for DNA-damaging agent. But none of the drugs exerted diarrhea. One of the major limitations of urinotecan for the clinician is diarrhea. And this diarrhea could be very severe. None of these drugs produce diarrhea. The pharmacokinetics is also very favorable, hours versus very short pharmacokinetics for urinotecan and topotecan. And then what the reason this was so good in the animal is that this drug has a particularly remarkable tumor retention. We could not predict this in the uh, cell line model, even in the murine models. And then in all cases, we could see gamma H2X response demonstrating target engagement. So at this stage where I am with these drugs, so these drugs have been licensed. I still have a number of them that are, not, that are still patented but not licensed, which I think could be second generation. But the next question is phase two. So if you go to phase two, you cannot do a phase two totally in the, in, you have to choose your patient population to, to make sure you could get responses. So the question is, what kind of patient should you select to enrich for responses for TOPO1 inhibitors? One of the answers is the homologous recombination deficiency. So you all know now that the PARP inhibitors are selectively given, that's labeled in the FDA approval, that BRCA deficient tumor, 
homologous recombination deficient tumor or platinum sensitive tumors are eligible for PARP inhibitors. What is less known is that the TOPO1 inhibitors are also extremely selective for BRCA deficient tumors. This was known in yeast because in yeast, yeast is usually not sensitive to campotestin unless you mutate RAD52 which is homologous recombination in yeast. That's been known for 20 years, 30 years. It's only now that we're connecting the dots. So if a tumor is BRCA deficient, it is really sensitive to TOPO1 inhibitor. This is an example. This is one of our drugs, LMP744. These are chicken DT40 cells where you could knock out BRCA1, BRCA2, PALB2. The wild type cells are in blue, and the BRCA deficient cells are in red. And you could appreciate that at 10, 12 nanomolar, where the wild type cells are not killed, the BRCA deficient cells are killed more than 50%. So there is a very nice window whereby these drugs should be more active in BRCA deficient. So if a BRCA deficient tumor fails to respond to PARP inhibitors uh, for multiple reasons, those patients could be eligible. But the second question, since the BRCA deficient tumors are already given PARP inhibitors, you could also consider doing combination. So what would happen if you were to combine two types of drugs that target the BRCA pathway? So this is one example of, of this type of, of preclinical experiment. So if you take a BRCA deficient in red versus a wild type in blue, and you treat with olaparib. So olaparib will not kill the wild type cells. Olaparib will kill the BRCA deficient substantially better. Now, if you add this concentration of LMP744, which doesn't kill the wild type, the combination still doesn't kill the wild type. But now if you combine the PARP inhibitor with the TOPO1 inhibitor, you're getting a much better response. So the synergy is exerted in the BRCA context. So when I'm thinking now of the phase two, we'll have to go probably phase two single agent. I can't get around that but where I really would want to go is phase two combination therapy, patient who are already receiving olaparib or talazoparib or niraparib, and then add on the TOPO1 inhibitor to further enhance the responses which, is, which these data suggest. So where we are now is these drugs, uh, in spite of all the trend and having seen all the DNA uh, protein, all the protein kinase inhibitors come in and then the wave now waving out and then the, 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 the checkpoint, immune checkpoint inhibitor waving up. So we've pushed our own wave under the big wave and those drugs are now ready for the further clinical development. What I could say is now the campotestin are not the only TOPO1 inhibitor that can be used for cancer chemotherapy, that there are, our drugs are selective for BRCA deficient tumors they overcome the limitations of the camptotestins because we know these limitations. The chem limitations, as I said, is chemical instability. We have overcome that problem. Our drugs are chemically stable. They form more stable DNA topo cleavage complexes in cells, so they are more DNA damaging. Our drugs are not eliminated by the P-glycoprotein pumps, whereas the camptotestins are. So we should expect activity in drug efflux overexpressing tumors. They have long plasma half-life versus the camptotestin, which is the couple of hours. The dose-limiting toxicity is still bone marrow, but we have no diarrhea. So therefore, it is legitimate to consider them. Like, for instance, in, in children or young people with hemorrhoid sarcoma, the problem of urine otican is diarrhea. And the pediatricians are now looking for drugs that will avoid this diarrhea, which is very difficult for the patients. So the second way to look for determinant of response is to take an unbiased approach. And this approach is open to everybody. It's open to you. It was open to us. The question is, how do you get there? And for me, the answer was relatively simple. Uh, we figured that the cancer cell line genomics was there, and it's just a matter of using it. And the the, the so you have two ways to get at cancer cell line genomic. One, you could do single cell knockout, and then you have a panel of cells, but it's preconceived because you're not dealing with the whole genome. But in the case of the PARP inhibitors, 
this was quite fruitful. So when we did this, for example, with Olaparib, we had a collection of DT40 cells where single uh, DNA repair knockout genes. And what you could appreciate here right away is what you know, all the uh, homologous recombination deficient cells are, are hypersensitive. They are to the left of the wild type. Wild type is here, left is hypersensitive. What we also learn, which is still not implemented in the clinic, is cancer cells with replication bypass deficiency also are hypersensitive. <laughs> What we also learned, which was published, it's becoming implemented now, is the Fanconi deficiency also give rise to sensitivity to Olaparib. But what, what came out of this data was that the, when you knock out PARC1, contrary to what you would expect, the cells were extremely resistant. And the only explanation we could come up with at the time was the following. What was known is that the PARP inhibitor should be cytotoxic because when cells generate strand breaks and replication comes in, the single strand breaks are generated, converted to double strand breaks. And those double strand breaks require homologous recombination. If you put a PARP inhibitor, the single strand breaks are not repaired, therefore you generate more replication double strand break, therefore you become very dependent on BRCA. But our interpretation based on the PARP knockout was that actually PARP was necessary to kill the cell, therefore PARP was trapped by the PARP inhibitors. And now what, what's happening is you get this PARP trapping which then blocks replication and the cells are sensitive not only if they lack BRCA but also if they lack the replication bypass and a number of other elements. So it led to the idea that PARP inhibitors were not only DNA repair inhibitor, but they were DNA damaging agents. And when we first came out with this, the drug companies were not particularly happy. AstraZeneca was going to FDA for approval, and then FDA said, your drugs are cytotoxic, they're potentially mutagenic, be clear, tell us. And AstraZeneca sort of didn't pull it totally out of the hat, but at the end they did, and then the drug got approved because they are DNA. DNA damaging agents when they work as single agents. And the molecular mechanism you have to keep in mind, and that has to do with the PARP biology, is that when PARP, PARP is very abundant in every cell, but it's not usually very much activated. PARP is activated when it binds to single-stranded breaks. So the DNA binding of PARP binds to the single-strand break, and then there's an allosteric change in the protein which activate the catalytic domain, which now start burning NAD. And when it burns NAD, it makes the polymer. And the polymer then stop the binding to DNA. So PARP is initially activated, but then gets poly uh, auto-modified, then is released. So the PARP inhibitors are all NAD mimetics. And what happens is they bind to this NAD pocket, and some of them, when they bind to the pocket, probably have a counter allosteric effect, which then interferes with the unlocking of PARP from DNA. So that's what we call actually the reverse allosteric. It's not been proven. It's still a sort of a hypothetical view, but I think it's very plausible because PARP works by allosteric forward and then allosteric backwards. So if you look at all the PARP inhibitors, they all have this nicotinamide moiety that binds to the NAD sites. And now there are five PARP inhibitors that are uh, in the clinic, Three have been approved. Uh, the first was uh, the, uh, um, the Olaparib, and then the next one, then you had uh, the Neraparib, and then the Recaparib, and all this is very recent, very pleasing. And there are two PARP inhibitors still not approved, Veliparib and Talazoparib. And they are very different. They're actually the extreme opposite. Uh, Veliparib doesn't trap very well. It's a very good catalytic and specific catalytic inhibitor. And talazoparib is extremely potent. And if you look at the chemical structure, the difference, this is bulky. It has racemic centers. And probably when it binds, it just locks into the NED site and distorts PARP, and it cannot disengage from DNA. So that's, that's the vision at this time. Now, if you go back and you compare the DT40 cell line, what you realize is that they all look very much alike in terms of the pattern of activity, except Veliparib, that it doesn't matter whether PARP is knockout because it doesn't, it doesn't trap PARP. So PARP knockout is not particularly resistant. Now, 
the next thing that came about with thalazoparib, because it's so cytotoxic, when we put in the NCI-60. So NCI-60 cell, and I've had many 60 cell lines for a long time uh, to, to, to determine uh, drug activity. And when we put thalazoparib in the NCI-60, so each bar is a cell line, you could appreciate yourself. This is the uh, IC50. So if you go very far here, this would be active at nanomolar. So one thing you could see for yourself is there are only a few cell lines that are sensitive. You could see them, and it's very clear, very sensitive. But there are a lot of cells that are resistant. So thalazoparib is, is a very interesting drug because either the cells respond or they totally don't respond, even at 100 micromolar. So the question is why? And it's not BRCA, because in the NCI60, there is no BRCA1, and there is only one BRCA2, and it doesn't match. So how do you deconvolute what determines resistance? And the beauty of this is we have all the genomics for all these cell lines. So now you could match the genomics with the drug response. So we know it's BRCA independent, but what is it? So all we did at the time was to use the old-fashioned compare analysis. So if you go to the NCI Developmental Therapeutics Program website or to our website, you could use this. And when we did this, there was a top gene. So if you go to this particular website, which is active, you could do it on your own. Uh, you just plug in in Google, discover.nci, it will take you there. And you will get these plots. And when we have thalazoparib, so all these cells here are non-responsive. And the gene, the most obvious genetic match was one gene that I was not knowledgeable, which is called SLFN11, which is Schlafen11. And you could see the expression of that gene across the NCI60 cell line. So this is average expression. These cells do not express the gene, and these express the gene. And it matches cell by cell the activity of thalazoparib. Low expression, resistance, high expression, sensitivity, and it matches like two keys. Then the question became, okay, so maybe we could go to bigger database, and now what we do in 60, you could do it on 1,000. And the problem was that all these databases, the broad database, the Sanger database, they're all wonderful, but they all have a different language. So let's say in the UK, they would speak uh, whatever, and, and in, the, in Boston they speak whatever, and then in, in Bethesda they speak whatever, and you cannot go across. So we created now a website which you're welcome to use, which is the Cell Miner website, which is now, this is accessible in BioArchive. So if you go in BioArchive and you put my name, you'll find it, it's the second one, the uh, paper. And it will give you the website, and when you used it now, you can and this was done, it's not a big effort. Don't think of the NCI being a huge machine. When you're in the intramural program, it is a small machine. It's, a, it's really, uh, 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 you know, it, shops, not, not factories. So this is our little shop. And we created that in collaboration with the Sanger Institute and Mass General Institute, with the Broad Institute, CCLE. And we took all these cancer cell line data we unified them with the same genomic parameters and all the drug response parameters in such a way that anyone can then connect genomics, protein, mutation, methylation, copy number with drug response. So if you do that, and you could go on your own again, I'm not going to click, but this would work. Uh, you could do multivariate analysis and monovariate analysis. And when I did that for my TOPO1 inhibitor, the top variant was Schlafen 11. And if you do it yourself for thalazoparib, the PARP inhibitor, which is also called BMN743, this is the screen as it would look. It's an XY plot. So let's say you choose the uh, Sanger data. You choose BMN673, which is thalazoparib, on one axis, the X axis. And then uh, you could choose anything on the other axis. In that case, I put PARP1. And then you chose the GDSC Sanger data. So you're going to have a thousand cell line. It's going to tell you among all the parameters, all the gene expression, all the mutations, BRCA included, what is the most significant determinant of response to thalazoparib? And the answer is SLFN11. And the, you could see the correlation coefficient, the p value, 
compared to the next one. There's a huge gap. So now I have to tell you what is SLFN11. So we, when we discovered this about four years ago, uh, then the tr translation of SLFN11 is Schlafen 11. And it Schlafen means, in German, it means sleep. And for a couple of years, I totally dismissed it until one of the postdocs decided to do siRNA with it. But then at the same time, become quite interested. Initially, I was actually turned off because Schlafen 11 was part of the native immune response, interferon res responsive gene. I was not as hot as today. It is a nuclear protein, putative DNA, RNA, LEK. So that became interested. And along the time, we published a number of papers describing why it is very high in HEWING, for instance, or in, in, in leukemia, because it's driven by FLY1, the ETH transcription factor. So this we published. It was all phenomenology. We knew what was turning it on. We knew that many cancer cells actually turn it off. We knew it was by epigenetics. And then what came out, and that made it even a little more trendy for many people, is, as I told you, its activity was related to PARP inhibitors. So now for the clinical trial, all the companies knew about this, and they all know, and they're all looking. And to validate this, what we did, we did CRISPR-Cas9. So we took four different cell lines. So this is one example uh, of, for the PARP inhibitors. So this is the wild-type prostate DU145 response to talazoparib or laparib. You knock out uh, Schlafen 11 in two different clones, the cells become highly resistant. And I'm not showing this. These are big, big, big differences. You could appreciate. This is log scale. And that's true for both PARP inhibitors in the prostate cell. It's true in the MOLD4 leukemia cell, true in the leukemia CEM cell, and in Ewing cell. So that told us that Schlafen determines the response to a broad range of DNA-targeted agents, which are widely used clinically, TOPO1 inhibitors, TOPO2 inhibitors, PARP inhibitors, cisplatin, carboplatin, gemcitabine, hydroxyurea, but not to protein kinase inhibitors, not to tubulin inhibitors. This is specific to DNA damaging agents. The activity of Schlafen 11 in killing cancer cell is independent of BRCA1. Because when we took our Schlafen positive, the red, and the Schlafen knockout in blue, and bear in mind this is a log scale, so these differences are very big. And if you knock out BRCA, in a Schlafen negative cell, you could sensitize it. If you knock out BRCA2 in a Schlafen deleted cell, you still sensitize. And that's true in the U145 and in this other cell line here. So it means Schlafen 11, whatever it does, is independent of BRCA1. So the way we see it is that in response to PARP inhibitors, TOPO1 inhibitors, TOPO2 inhibitors, cisplatin, one of the early events is replicative stress. And replicative stress normally activates ATR. And the activation of ATR, as you know, is a way for the cells to slow down replication, which then enables them to do the repair. At the same time, the cells uh, recruit the uh, BRCA1, BRCA2, and then they engage homologous recombination, and that also enables survival. And you also know that ATR inhibitors are developed by drug companies today, and they are active in the clinic because when you block ATR, the cells cannot cope with replication stress, therefore they die. Well, where is Schlafen here? Schlafen is not on this pathway. It is on a parallel pathway, which was totally unknown until now, I think, which is that when cells undergo replicative stress, they engage Schlafen, that produces a very persistent replication arrest and death. I'll just show you one or a couple figures from the paper that just came out explaining what we think Schlafen does and how it works. So if you take uh, Schlafen deleted cells, which are many of the cancer cell lines you're using in your lab, and you look at a nucleus and you look at replication foci using uh, the stymidine analog, which you could use to label replication foci by your little pulse. And by click chemistry, you could see where the replication foci is here. So all these are replication foci, 
within the 30 minutes of the pulse. When you treat with a TOPO1 inhibitor, relatively short treatment, all the replication is shut down. When you put an ATR inhibitor at the same time as a TOPO1 inhibitor, replication is actually not stopped anymore. So you get replication in this cell. But these cells are going to die now because this replication uh, interferes with the repair. What happened in Schlafen positive cell? In a Schlafen positive cell, when you transfect with Schlafen, so they replicate fine. You treat with camptotensin, they stop replication. Then you put an ATR inhibitor, they cannot recover replication. It means that Schlafen overrides the ATR inhibitor. When you have Schlafen, the cells cannot recover replication. And when they do this, Schlafen binds to chromatin. So all these little dots are Schlafen foci now in the cells treated with replicative damage by camptotensin, And this is not interfered with by the ATR inhibitor. Schlafen binds to chromatin and blocks replication. We then transfected these cells with a helicase dead. Schlafen 11 has a helicase motif, and we mutated one residue to block the ATPase activity. So this is this residue E669Q. When we mutate and transfect, so the cells still block replication in response to camptotensin, but now ATR inhibitor is able to overcome this ATR, this Schlafen mutant. And what we see is that the mutant Schlafen still engages on chromatin, makes replication, makes little Schlafen foci. But the beauty of this is that since cells are now replicating again, you could see that Schlafen is exactly on the replication foci. So what it means is that Schlafen 11 binds to replication factories. It produces an ATR independent replication block in relationship to its ATPA's activity. But what is this ATPase activity doing? So to look for what it does, we use the attack, which is a, a recombinase test to look at chromatin opening. So we did attack sequencing in these cells we did with camptotensin. And in short, what we see in the Schlafen positive cell, we see these in camptotensin treated Schlafen positive, we see this opening of chromatin very near the replication origins. And you could see here all these attack sites. So Schlafen 11 irreversibly arrests replication by opening chromatin. I'm going to skip that. So the model, as we proposed, and I think the, the working uh, idea now, is that when cells undergo replicative damage, such as camptotensin, hydroxyurea, or other agents, or when you activate replication stress with the CHECK1 inhibitor, praxisertib, the cells undergo replication stress. And the question we all have is, what is replication stress? How you could define it? I think for me, the best definition is an uncoupling between the polymerase and the helicase. Normally, the helicase of replication is very close to the polymerase. But when replication is stressed, you get long single-stranded DNA regions that bind replication protein A, RPA. Normally, this recruits ATR, which slows down replication, but it also recruits Schlafen when cells have Schlafen. And what Schlafen then does is opens chromatin, and you get irreversible replication block. So in fact, what you seem to see, to, to conclude at this stage, is that Schlafen blocks stress replication in a way that the cells are triaged and they are put aside, and they are not going to go any further. So it's kind of a threshold. It's like a guardian. If it engages, the cells are going to die. So why was this not known before? And does it really relate to a lot of cancer cells? Am I just telling you a little story about a very detailed story? Well, if you look at the cancer cell line again, so the NCI60 cell line, each dot is a cell line. The CCLE, there are a thousand cell line, or the Sanger cell line, there are a thousand cell line. And you look at Schlafen expression, it's very obvious that there are two kinds of cells. There are the cells that do not express Schlafen, and there are the cells that express Schlafen. And when they express it, they express it high level. And it's really bimodal. And the fraction of cells that do not express Schlafen is about 50% of the cancer cell line. And many of the cell lines that you're using in your lab and are being used for cell screening are actually Schlafen negative. 
HeLa Cells, U2OS, HCT116, RKO, MCF7, MDA231. All of these are in here. And therefore, you could never see the impact of Schlafen because those cells didn't express it. If you look at TCGA, and I think it's quite kind of interesting, this is also relevant for real cancers because if you look at real cancers, this is RNA-seq for all the cancers that were in the TCGA. There is a very, very broad range of expression. So for each cancer, like bladder here, these are the normal and these are the cancers. And you can see the range of expression is huge. So some patient cancers, bladder cancer, have a lot of schlafen, not so many, but there are some, and many, many of them turn it off. And you could go through many cancers that way. And what I told you for hewing, or AML is here, like hewing, AML is here, hewing is there. And so many, many cancer cells inactivate schlafen, and other cells hyperactivate. So when you go back to the cell and start asking yourself, Maybe it makes sense that the cell would underactivate or inactivate Schlafen because if they have replication stress, otherwise they couldn't grow. So the question becomes, okay, how do they inactivate Schlafen? And it's very easy in the cancer cell line to do this, and you could do it yourself using the website. You could look at Schlafen expression, so all these have high Schlafen, and all these have no Schlafen. And now you could plot the methylation. And what's very obvious is that epigenetics drives the inactivation of Schlafen in about half of the cells that do not express Schlafen. It's very obvious. You get the data right at the fingertip. What's obvious as well is about half of the cells do not express Schlafen, but there is no uh, DNA hypermethylation. So is it really chromatin mark? Is it epigenetics? Could you test it? So in a paper that just came out, we tested the epigenetic regulation of Schlafen using the HDAC inhibitors. So the HDAC inhibitors have been in the clinic for a while. They are used in, mostly in blood cancers, not in solid tumors, and they are still looking for the best way to use them in solid tumors. But what was quite rewarding is when we treated here these uh, K562 leukemia cells that have low Schlafen, no promoter hypermethylation, when we treated with these two HDAC inhibitors, clinically relevant, Romidepsin and antinostat at pharmacological concentration, nanomolar romidepsin, low micromolar romidep, uh, antinostat. Within 24 hours, 24 hours, Schlafen 11 is reactivated very clearly. And not only the transcript, but also the protein. But if you take a class 3 HDAC inhibitor, uh, rosininostat, it does not reactivate Schlafen. Uh, this is just not one cell line, we did in about 15 cell lines. And this is another example in this HT10 AD fibrosarcoma that do not express Schlafen to start, but you could unlock it if you put an HDAC inhibitor. So you could see it here. You unlock the transcript, you unlock the protein with these two HDAC inhibitors, but not with the class 3 HDAC. And when you do this, the cells that initially are not very sensitive to camptotestin, like here, when you start combining with the HDAC inhibitor, you could see the opening of these curves, and you get this very nice synergy. And that's true not only for romidepsin, but also for antinostat. That's not only true for K562, but also for K1080. You see the opening of this curve is remarkable. We don't have to calculate combination index to convince you here. And this is, doesn't synergize for the non-Schlafen drugs like Plaquitaxel, which has nothing to do with Schlafen. So where we are now is that Clearly, Schlafen is a newcomer in the chemotherapy field and even in biology. There's a lot of interest. I think you will see more and more paper coming out about this family of genes. So if you take a patient and the tumor uh, is high in Schlafen, probably it would be legitimate to uh, submit the patient to uh, DNA-targeted therapy. That's what's been looked at for the PARP inhibitors now. It's not used as a selection, but it's been deconvoluted in historical trials. Now, if the tumor is Schlafen deficient, right away, I don't think it would be such a hot idea to treat with a DNA damaging agent or PARP inhibitor. This is much more prevalent than BRCA. So you could decide, let's go to non-targeted therapy, which is not DNA targeted therapy, which is fine. But if you're like me and you would still want to use DNA targeted agents, you would want to reactivate Schlafen, and it's possible. So there are two papers, one with five is cited in, 
which has been published in 2016, and one from the memorial with, in small cell lung with ACH2 inhibitor, they were able to reactivate Schlafen and make them sensitive, the, the cells and the PDX sensitive to DNA damaging agent. And what I told you today is you could use HDAC inhibitor also to reactivate Schlafen in Schlafen negative, non-promoter hypermethylated. So you have to choose your subgroup. So in addition, if cells are Schlafen deficient, they only rely on ATR to rescue themselves against replication stress. And in those cells, the ATR inhibitor combined with DNA damaging agents are actually very synergistic. So the other way, if cells are Schlafen negative, now an ATR inhibitor is likely to be beneficial if you use a DNA damaging agent. It is possible to measure Schlafen in the clinic. The antibodies are available. We, are, we have blood. Anybody can do it. It's been done at multiple institutions now. I've seen recent paper. MD Anderson does it. The memorial does it. So the antibodies work pretty well. Uh, in our hands, for instance, these are two colon carcinoma. And this is a positive colon cancer. You could see all the nuclei are positive. And this is a negative colon carcinoma. All the nuclei are blue. What I find very interesting is that even in a Schlafa negative cancer, the stroma is positive. It's very interesting to me. It goes back to the native immune function of Schlafen. It's likely that the infiltrating cells also, in some cancers, express Schlafen. I do not have any idea what, what is the relationship with anything, but I think this would be a field of research that others cannot go into. So, and the last bit I want to convince you of is, you know, I was talking to the radiotherapist yesterday night, and, and I think radiotherapy has been really the first time that targeted therapy has been applied. The other way, surgery, which is really also targeted therapy, you only deal with the tumor. In chemotherapy, we have had, and we still have this idea that we could throw toxins to a body and it's going to find the right cell. Well, you know, if you cure your grass, you could put a herbicide over the whole grass. You could also just go and plug some of the bad thing yourself. I think in cancer, you could do that now. And the reason I want to tell you that is that, yes, you could use molecular signature. You could sharpen your treatment using this signature. But really, you should not dismiss the idea that targeted delivery is the way to go. So young minds like yours, not mine because I'm not a good enough biotech guy to make targeted delivery, but that's really a nice field to go into. And where it comes in a rewarding f way for me, when I start looking at what the biotechs are doing and the smaller pharma and now the bigger pharma, where they were doing uh, the targeted delivery of uh, drugs, they initially went to very toxic drugs. Uh, toxins or PBD. Now they're going back to tolerable drugs and the TOPO1 inhibitors are actually coming back as payloads. And these are all the drugs that are used by different pharmaceutical company, including that very nice drug now uh, with Daiichi Sancho, which you may have heard, the camptothecin with HER2, and they have camptothecin HER3. And the, the re clinical results are quite good, much better than the TOPO1 alone. And so I'm very enthusiastic. I think you could use the TOPO1 inhibitors as a warhead. We know they are safe to use. Uh, and then you increase delivery to the tumor. So since we have a clinical branch now in our, in our branch, we have a clinical group, we started this uh, by the following approach. So we have two tumor-targeted delivery TOPO1 inhibitor in our clinic, in, the phase, in our little clinic in phase one. We have one which is CRLX101, which is an irinotecan PEG, and the second one is Onivide, which came from Boston, which is irinotecan liposome. It's approved for pancreatic cancer. So the idea is that you would administer the TOPO1 targeted delivery on day one and on day 15. Now the drug goes into the body, and it's, it is supposed to uh, stay in the tumor for a long time. Whereas in the bone marrow, it's suddenly very transient. So the, the idea, and our protocols are developed that way, is we come up with the combination therapy at day three. So now we come up with a PARP inhibitor or with an ATR inhibitor only at day three. 
when the bone marrow is clear, but the tumor is still loaded. So we, dec we should increase therapeutic index. This is, for now, wishful thinking. The clinical trials are ongoing, and then we'll see how they progress. But I would like to see these trials being done elsewhere, because the principle is fairly simple. If the targeted delivery works, I think this should work. So I think this is an added selectivity for cancer cells. You could use a synthetic lethality driven by, you know, what you know about synthetic lethality, but also by the targeted delivery. So this is the summary of what I've been talking about, telling you that TOPO1 inhibitors are still coming up and there are new drugs that are better than what is in the clinic now, that I think there is no way around the fact we have to match the drug with the tumor and that we are not finished with this. There are many, many determinants that you guys have to find beyond everything we know. And I think bioinformatics and genomics is at the fingertip. Cancer cell lines are useful. And I think we made this website not for us, uh, not for having a line on my CV, but for you to use and make good use of it. So this is accessible. You could go and we'll take any comment you have if you don't like it. You could write the comment on the, on the bio archive. There is, there is a chat room there. You could say, this is crap, this is great, whatever. And you could send an email to us. We'll try to accommodate your thoughts. Uh, I talked to you about Schlafen. I think you will hear much more about this gene in the coming years. It may become very important, I think. Uh, I think we're still looking at the uh, impact on the clinic. I think it may have an impact on the patients, and I'm hopeful it will. And I think to avoid toxicity to normal tissue, tumor-targeted delivery, like you do with radiation, like you do with surgery, we should do it with chemotherapy. So this work is done in our lab. I mean, my clinician or our clinician, or I am his whatever, you know, basic researcher is Anish. He's a great guy, mostly work on small cell lung cancer. So our clinic is enriched for small cell lung cancer. And I'm very indebted to Jim Dorosho who is uh, the, the head of the Division of Cancer Treatment Diagnosis. So he deals with all the cancer centers, but his lab is also in our branch. So I have a very close relationship with him. So I appreciate your time. And if you have any question now or by email, I would be happy to answer. Right. Yeah, so we're doing this. What we did is we did an, uh, so with the NCATS, which is the, you, you may know it's, it's the national uh, chemi chemical screening. So we took the Schlafen positive, isogenic, Schlafen negative, and we ran about 2,000 drugs to find drug that work in Schlafen minus and Schlafen plus. So we're deconvoluting that. Uh, it's a very interesting idea to see if we're going to find uh, specific drugs. It, it, for now, we find more drugs active in Schlafen positive than in negative. So for some, <laughs> it's a killer rather than anything else. So yeah, it's a good thought. We would like to do that. Yeah, remember the conference if you if you ever want to learn about topoisomerase and chromatin.